All right. We have like two more slides. Or one slide and a summary, something like that. So breaking and continuing a loop. If your code's running in a loop, but you need to stop the loop early, you can do that. We've already seen that. I'm pretty sure we've used a break statement several different places. If your code needs to instantly begin to the, the next iteration of the loop without completing, like it's halfway done with its task, but nope, I'm going to start doing the next thing I need to do. You can also do that. Different keywords called continue rather than break. So kind of like this, right? We have a wild true loop. We're just running forever. Are you recording? Oh, I hope I am. Yes, I am. All right. So while true, and all we're doing is adding numbers. Well, we can make it a for loop, right? For int i is equal to zero, i is less than one hundred, i plus plus. We have decided for some reason that we're going to let the user kill this application early. So we might ask them, do you wish, wish to stop? Continue? Yes, no. And we ought to probably be entering this inside a, you know, Visual Studio. And we get that in, right? And if repeat is equal equal to no they want to stop else we're going to do whatever we're going to do with i right we may calculate some magical value right and z is equal to i times i times i print z whatever whatever we're supposed to do but then later on we decide that for all values of i that are evenly divisible by 3, we don't want to do these next steps. We don't want to do that and then print it out. And yeah, why don't we just do this inside of Visual Studio? So we're on U, if my reckoning is correct. Source file, lecture U dot CPP. Paste my boilerplate into it. All right, I'm going to write a loop. All it does is print a number and then ask the user if they want to continue. Except it's going to do it in the opposite order. It's going to ask them if they want to continue. Yeah, we can do it in this order that I just said. And for some reason, we've chosen to implement it as a while true, lowercase t, rather than putting in some kind of priming read and basing it on that as our loop control variable. So we need some counter. And didn't I just say we were going to use a for loop rather than a while true? Yeah. Delete that while true. Four parentheses int i equals zero. How about x? x is easier to read on the screen than i. X is equal to zero. X is less than 100. X plus plus. So we're going to print out. We're going to use the value of X for something. C out, error, error, quote. X cubed equals end quote, error, error, x times x times x, error, error, e and dl. Just to be doing some kind of work with our counter variable. Now we're going to ask the user if they wish to continue. 
string s c out error arrow less than less than quote continue y slash n space space angle to tell them where to type close quote semicolon and then c i n arrow arrow into s and if s is equal to no they no longer want to repeat so if just let me finish typing this three things before I forget. If s equal equals no, end quote, in parentheses, next line break. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's that um, forward arrow uh, for? That's just a place to start typing. Oh. Let me show you what it looks like when it runs. I, I, I just have re yeah, I just recently have decided that I'm going to make all my programs do that, so I haven't been inflicting that too much on y'all yet. My fundamentals classes did it right. Just telling us where to type. Nope, it's not a special thing, not a special command. Good question. But we've also decided that on the rare moments <coughs> that it's evenly divisible by ten, or nah, let's just skip all even numbers. Now, sure, we could modify our for loop to do this, but if x mod 2 equals equals 0, meaning it's an even number. We're just going to skin, skip it. So open curly brace, see out, arrow, arrow, quote, skipping, end quote, arrow, arrow, x, arrow, arrow, ENDL. And then put the word continue here. Continue means don't do anything else in the loop immediately jump back to the top of the loop and keep running. Kind of like a break except a break exits the loop and continue so it goes to the bottom of the loop and bails whereas continue goes back up to the top of the loop and increments x or whatever the increment step is, the update step is. Make sure it works before I brag too much about it. All right, x cubed is 1. Do we want to continue? Sure, why not? It skipped 2. All right. Continue. Well, it did 2, and then it did x cubed is 27. So it did cube 3. Continue. Yeah, sure. It skipped 4, and then it did 5 cubed. Right? So it's skipping every even number. And I'm sure we remember why, because something modulus 2, if it's equal to 0, there was no remainder, so it's an even number. We could change that so it only skipped every third, right? X modulus 3. And it's going to keep repeating as long as we don't type no. Yeah, okay. It did 2. It skipped 3. It did 4. It did 5. It skipped 6, and so on. So you see what continue does. Continue causes it to immediately jump back up to the top, perform the update step, and then start running again. So when it hits continue, it doesn't do any of this business. And that can be useful. Why? Because you could have a loop and then maybe you're asking the user for something and then if they give you bad input, you could just immediately con print out that message, continue, and jump back up to the top of the loop. That'd be a way to force them to enter good input. Handle your error condition by printing out the error message and then continuing. So that would look something like this. And again, you could do this differently, like with a priming read or something. While, parentheses, true, in parentheses, let's ask a question. C out, arrow, arrow, enter a number, anything but 10, backslash, end quote semicolon. And I put the arrows going the wrong way. My mistake. The arrows go towards the C out. Less than, less than. Now let's let them type that in. Int n cin greater than greater than n. And then we're going to check to see if it's equal to 10 because we told them not to. If n equals equals 10 
but if you yell at them, see out error, error, quote, weren't you listening? No 10. Backslash in. And then continue. Helps if you spell continue correctly. Content to continue. All right. Now we might ask them if they want to repeat again, right? String s, c out, arrow, arrow, quote. Repeat. Y slash n. Did I do something wrong? Uh, yeah, why, why am I stuck on the arrows going the wrong way? There we go. C out, less than, less than. Repeat, y n, space, space, greater than symbol. For some reason, I didn't do the greater than symbol up there. So what? Greater than, in quotes, and then semicolon, and then c i n, arrow, arrow, into s. And if s is equal to n, then we're going to break. Now we could avoid doing that break. We could write this as a do loop and keep repeating while s is not equal to n, right? Any loop you write with a break statement can probably be written without a break statement. But we're just demonstrating a concept so you can tuck it away into your brain. And if you find a legit reason to be want to break out of a loop, you can. All right. Continue, sure, why not? Continue, continue. Okay, we're tired of that game. Enter a number, anything but 10. 9? Yeah, that was fun. 11? Yeah, that was fun. Keep continuing. 10? Weren't you listening? No 10. Right, so that's a legit reason to use continue. To rule out an error state, if there is an error state, you display your message or something like that, and then you immediately continue so you don't have to worry about doing the rest of this stuff or handling how you're going to do the rest of that stuff. Now, sure, you could put an else clause and embed everything in there, but by the time you're handling like four or five or six different error states, you know, error conditions, and you're not using continue to force the reiteration of the loop, then the logic starts to look really ugly. Anybody got syntax errors I need to go eyeball? Anybody need me to keep it on this screen? Just a second. All right. Can you run up a little bit? All righty. I will do so. You let me know and I can scroll up. Because she needs to? Okay. I need to look at what's going on up there, too. All right. That's cool. There we go. And let me come over and help. I guess technically there's one between these two, but I really want to start talking about arrays right now. Plus, we've been doing functions quite a bit already. All right, what are arrays? Well, I mentioned classes last semester, not last semester, on Tuesday. And what is a class? It's a group of data and the functions that act on it. And so the data can be of any type, right? You have a, a name and you have an integer for the age and, you know, stuff like that. Well, an array is another way to hold a set of data, but they're all data of the same type. And they're not just one entity, right? They're not just about one book or one person or whatever. It's like a series of prices or a series of ages or a series of names. So arrays hold multiple values. An array is a variable that can hold multiple values of the same type. 
they all have to be of the same type. Now, somebody argued with me, and it's they must have been a, a programmer, that you could store all data in a string and then convert that data to any type that you needed to. And yeah, technically that's true, but still, all the data is a type string in that case. You're just going to be treating it in different ways based on what's stored in it. So if you have an array of ints, the only thing you can store it is ints. If you have an array of strings, what you store it in is strings. And here's what's kind of important is that the values are stored in adjacent memory locations. If you use Python lists, if you've used Java array lists, this is not true that they're stored in contiguous locations. Arrays are special. They are stored in contiguous locations, meaning that if you have 100 ints, then 400 ints of 400 bytes of your computer's RAM are dedicated to holding that array. It's all nice and contiguous. It can be summoned into your you know, your computer's RAM, you know, your processor's RAM with a single, you know, chip call. They can be cached so that the computer can, you know, access that RAM exceptionally fast. Uh, arrays are the fastest form of data structure there are. Now, lists or vectors as they're known in C++ and Python lists and array lists and stuff like that are all more convenient than arrays because they can grow and shrink, whereas arrays are fixed in length. Once we declare this array of length 5, it's going to be length 5. We're not going to be able to delete the second element from it. We can replace it, you know, but we can't delete it. And we can't append something to the end of it. Now, technically you can, but it's a complicated process. Why? You have to allocate a new array of six elements, fill, copy all these elements into the new array, then fill in the sixth one, then destroy the old one, right? And now you have an array, an array of six. It's like having a trailer park with five arrays in it, excuse me, five trailers in it, and then you want to add a sixth trailer to it. So you have to go and you have to, you know, claim somebody else's land, tack on, you know, the sixth trailer, move all the other ones into your new land, whatever. So arrays are fixed in length, which can be a drag if you're used to using data structures in other languages, such as Python's lists that grow and shrink as you need them. They are all of the same type. Once we have declared this as an array of ints, then every piece of value in here is going to be an int. Also not true of Python, where if you feel like sticking a, uh, an int, followed by a string, followed by a float, followed by a boolean as members of the of a list, then that's totally valid. But Python is a completely different beast. So in this definition, int test subscript 5, that's the data type. The int is the data type. You could replace that with string or care or unsigned int or float or double, long, long. Test is the name of the array. And then that 5 is known as the size declarator, if I'm pronouncing that correct. I hope so. Declarator. Declarator. It shows the number of elements in the array. Now, here's what I kind of irks me, is that they say that the size declarator is this, and then they si say that the size of the array is the number of elements times the size of each element. Okay. If I was writing these textbooks, I would say that this is the length declarator, that the array is five elements long. But then the size of the array in bytes, size of the array in bytes, is the number of elements times the size of each element. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's make an array and print out its size. And let's do it up at the very top of main so that we don't have to keep answering these questions before we get to the good stuff. Let's make an array of four ints. It's called nums. Notice the syntax is backwards for you Java guys who are used to doing this. Right, to make an array reference. Java just had to be a little bit different. However, Java does actually support this syntax. They just don't support sticking that number in it. Okay. We want to put a value in the first one. Nums subscript 0 is equal to 100. Now I'm going to put a value in the second one. Num subscript 1 is equal to 200. Num subscript 2 
is equal to 300 when I say subscript I mean the square brace followed by the number followed by the n square brace the subscript is also known as the index and a num subscript 3 is equal to yeah let's be weird 500 why did I number them 0 through 3 because this is known as zero based indexing the first element is zero it's still four elements you can count them there right zero one two three that's four elements it's just that we start counting with three at, I mean a zero so you cannot get to element four or it's out of bounds now this language will actually let you access past the end of the array it may generate an error it may not Languages like Java and Python do some checking to make sure you're not checking past the end of the array. And what do I mean past the end of the array? If I added that, we created something only with four boxes. And then we're saying, yo, in the fifth box, we want to put something. It actually works. It might give a syntax error. It might not. I'm going to run it and see if the debugger complains about it. It did not complain. Oh, and then it did. At the very end, the debugger said, oh, runtime check. The stack around the variable nums was corrupted. It caught the fact that there was some data corruption that we wrote past the end of the array. If we compiled it in release mode rather than debug mode, if we pull this down and we changed it to release, and then we rebuilt it and ran it, debug start without debugging, it probably would not catch it. So it's possible that some memory got corrupted and we didn't notice it. Now, really, the only memory that's getting corrupted is the memory that's owned by this process. So it's not like our program, by doing that, is going to crash the entire computer anymore. Back in the old days, before, uh, before the operating system protected one program from modifying the memory of another, then, yeah, you could crash the entire computer by writing past the end of the array. Still, it's something you don't want to do. Let me switch back into debug mode. So let's make a comment to the effect. And by the way, I'm tired of uh, of entering these loops, so I'm just going to stick a return zero right there to stop it from doing those four loops. And I'm going to delete that line because it caused an error. Or at least I'm going to comment it out. This would be writing past the end of the array. The array is four elements long, meaning we can access elements or subscripts 0 through 3. If we tried hard, we could write a program that would demonstrate that if we went past the end of the array, we would be changing other values, other, other values in our program. We could be printing out the variables, you know, before and after we wrote past the end of the array, and we could spot one changing without us knowing about it. But we're not going to figure that out. Just take it on faith, please. Do not write past the end of the array. Well, how do you know if you're writing past the end of the array? We don't know how many how many elements there are in this thing. In a convenient language like Java or Python, we could ask the array how long it was. You can't do this, so don't even bother typing it. You know, um, you know, if you know x is less than the length of the nums array, right? That's good Python. Or in Java, if x is less than nums dot length. And that's good Java. C++ does not have a way of determining the length of the array. We can hack a kludge, though. We can ask the array how long it is and then figure out how many items are in it based on that.
let's print out the size of this array. So C out less than less than size of nums array equals end quote arrow arrow size of parentheses I'm going to go to the next line you don't got to do that you have more smaller font than I do size of nums arrow arrow quote space bytes backslash in oh and since I stuck a return here I better put my system pause there as well I guess with the system pause I wouldn't even need the return statement Alright, and so the size of the nums array is 16 bytes long. Why? Because an int is 4 bytes, it's a 32-bit value. 32 divided by 8 bits per byte is 4 bytes. So all we would have to do to calculate how many elements in the array is take the size of it and divide it by 4. Well, what if it was longs? Long, long, something like that. Well, they're not 4 bytes long. So here's how you calculate the length of an array if you can, if you're in a split in a place in the program where this works, and there are some places where it will not. Int num underscore items equals size of parentheses nums close parentheses divided by size of either int if we know the data type, or if we don't know the data type, we could just take the size of the first element in the array. So I'm going to get rid of that int and I'm going to replace it with size of parentheses nums subscript zero. And I'm sorry that that looks kind of weird. It'd be more comprehensible if you just made that int. Oh, and it looks like I'm missing a close parentheses. If we print out num items, it's going to say four because the size of the first element in it, since the first element is an int, that's 4. It was 32 bytes, no, it was 16 bytes long. Size of nums, we just printed out, it was 16. So 16 divided by 4 is 4 items, which is, in fact, how many we allocated. You don't have to do it that way if you just declare a constant that holds the size, which is a better solution. But we can calculate the size, the length of the array, on the fly by doing that. Let's print that out and make sure it works. C out error error quote number of items in array is end quote error error num underscore items underscore error error ENDL. All right, the number of the items in the array is four. Quite true, it is. But that's kind of going around our elbow to get to our face or whatever the saying is because we could have just said up here that we made that a constant like this. Let's define another array demonstrating that. Const space int space num underscore names equals three. We're going to store three names in an array. Now let's allocate an array. So we need the data type, which is going to be string, followed by the name, followed by a square brace and the number of items we want in it. So string space names, we could call it name array, but we called the other one nums, so I'm just going to roll with it. Names, subscript, and now I'm going to use my constant. Between the square braces, I'm going to put num underscore names. Now I don't have to mess with this size up business to know how many items are in it. 
Well, why do I care how many items are in it? So I could write flukes to go through it, print them all out, add up all the numbers, something like that. Let's print out all of our names. Oh, by the way, compile it, make sure there's no, uh, no syntax errors at this point. I'd rather not go much further. Of names, and we have an array of nums, but we didn't put any names in there. Well, let's put some names in there. Names, subscript zero, equals Gilligan. Name, subscript one, is equal to the skipper. And name, subscript two, is equal to Mr. Hal. Or uh, we don't want to leave the women out, Ginger. There we go. So let's print out our number array for parentheses int i for int short for index equals zero semicolon i is less than the number of numbers which we decided was called num items so i is less than num underscore items semicolon i plus plus Let's see out that array element. See out arrow arrow nums subscript i in subscript and an arrow arrow followed by a space or a comma. Yeah, a space will do. Notice I didn't put an E and DL there. I just want all the numbers to be lined up one after the other on the same same row. But if that's true, then I need to write out an E and DL after the loop. And do the names the same way, except it's not going to be num items, it's going to be num names. So for parentheses, int i is equal zero, i less than num underscore names, semicolon, i plus plus. See out arrow arrow names subscript zero. Now let's make this one look a little bit fancier. Changing my mind on this one. I'm going to use a curly brace here so I can put a block of code. And we're going to write out the index number and the name. So see out arrow arrow. Quote. Names, how about his name, space, end quote, error, error, I, error, error, quote, space is in space, end quote. I went to the next line, you don't have to. Error, error, names, subscript, I, in subscript, error, error, E and DL. What's the difference? The first one, the numbers are being printed out all on one line and we're waiting to hit the character turn, the enter key until, I mean, after the loop. The next one, we're printing both the index number and the value of it on the same line and then we're going to the next line. So we're gonna have three lines of text, zero, one, and two. And there we go. As predicted, all of our numbers printed out on one line, but our names, each appeared on their own line. Index zero is Gilligan, index one is Skipper, index two is Ginger. There's another way to allocate an array as well, where you pre-fill it with data. Here we've allocated our array by creating the array, allocating it there, and then sticking in pieces of data one by one. 
Well, we can fill it with data right when we create it if we use what's known as an initialization list or an initializer. So, int phone, I like phone number, subscript in subscript equals curly brace. If you like classic rock, you're going to know this number 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9. Now we don't know how long this array is. We could count them and fill it in, right? We might say that all phone numbers are seven digits long. Or we could use this strategy of calculating the number of items. Let's do that. Int len underscore phone equals size of parentheses phone in parentheses divided by size of parentheses int. And again, to be better programmers, we should make it the size of the first element rather than just size of int. Because what if later on we change these to longs or doubles or something? then our length is no longer accurate. This is a perfectly valid way of doing though, it's just not the most defensive. And now we can print our phone number out. Same idea, same kind of loop. We're going to print it with a slightly different loop though. This is known as a for each loop. The textbook may cause it something slightly different, may call it something slightly different. And you've seen this syntax if you're a Python programmer or you've used Java array lists. For int value colon len, wait, value colon phone for every item, maybe I'll just call it item, I don't know. For int item colon phone for every number we find, we're going to write it out. C out arrow arrow item arrow arrow endl. This way of accessing an array is known as using array indexing. That's an index based for loop. This is a value based for loop. Stepping through the array one by one. Now there's some magic involved here that I don't understand, which is if we can't get the length of the array by asking the array. How can the for statement do it? Notice that we didn't use this value. If we commented that value out, it's still going to work. So it's weird to me in this language that that works. But it does. They wanted to keep uh, neck and neck with Java, so they added support for that. All right, and there's our phone number, 8675309. We're going to print the, loop, the uh, array out. The same way using index based printing, an index based loop, just so that we can eyeball the differences and kind of decide which one we like better. For, I really wish I'd put value. I'm going to replace the words item with value. You don't have to. So, for int i is equal to zero. Same deal. I is less than len underscore phone. Semicolon. I plus plus. It looks like I have a syntax error. It looks like my int i wound up missing an i. What does len mean again? Length. Oh. oh, yeah, sorry. We could make it a better variable name. Length of underscore, length underscore phone. Like that. If I make that change, it's going to break somebody. I'm going to undo that. So C out arrow arrow phone subscript I in subscript arrow arrow ENDL. Now a lot of folks wouldn't calculate the size of the, the length of the array. They just put this expression 
right here. I'm going to undo it so you don't have to do it. Don't do it. They put that right there. That makes that for loop look carry right, but we didn't have to create a variable to hold that value. I don't particularly like that one because it's doing math inside the for loop, and if you're repeating that loop 7,000 times, it performs that operation 7,000 times, which is a lot slower than just looking up a variable. I'm going to undo that. For clarity, though, I'm going to cut this int lin foam and paste it above the loop that uses it. All right, I want you to eyeball the two loops. Which one do you like better? That one or that one? I like the first one better. The syntax is much cleaner. Unless I need to know the index number, I would do it the first way. The only reason you might want to not do it the first way is if, A, you need to know the index number for some reason. And do you remember up here when we were printing out the names of Skipper and whatever, we put the index numbers next to it, so we could not have done it that way? Or if you're going to change the array as you go through it, because in order to change an element of the array, you have to have its index number. So that for each syntax is great. I'm going to add a comment to that effect. For each syntax is great and simple, but is effectively read-only access to the array and doesn't let us have access to the index numbers. It doesn't give us indexes, index numbers, right? Because there's no I involved there. There's no counter. Yeah, you could fake it. You could create an int i is equal to zero above it and then increment that each time you're going through it. But if you're going to do that, you may as well use a for loop. This is the kind of thing I'd really, really like you to memorize. And we'll be doing it more and more, so it's not like this is the only chance you'll get to do it. But memorize these two syntaxes. Memorize the index-based loop and memorize the for each loop. Now the C-sharp language is cool because you actually have the word each in it. Like, Don't type this because it doesn't work in this language. But it's for each int value in phone. I like that, right? Tells you exactly what it's doing. But this one doesn't have that. I'm going to make the same problem and hope that it manifests here. What if you typoed that? What is wrong with that? We only have three spaces for numbers here, or for names, excuse me. Yeah, we only have three strings, and so we're putting in one in the first place, one in the second place, and one in the fourth place. That is that error that I was telling you about. You're writing past the end of the array. And it doesn't tell you that you're writing past the unit array. It's subtle. You don't know that there's a problem. And then you run it. And boom, I get an exception. And it doesn't show it in the right place. It shows it in this place. Now, hers was showing it in a different place still. You know, the behavior is kind of undefined. You can't predict how it's going to work. And so notice that now that I cover my mouse over num items, it says that the number of items is 6. But when it printed it out, number items was set to 4. So it got corrupted. Writing past the end of the array corrupted the value of num items. Brilliant example of it. And boy, it was hard to spot, right? We could have looked at that code all day and not notice that there was a 3 there where there was supposed to be a 2. So the 5 is known as the length declarator, although the book called it the size declarator. The size of the array is the total number of bytes times the number of bytes of each element. Doubles are 8 bytes long, and so if you have an array of 10 doubles, it's 80 bytes long. 
because 10 times 8 is 80. A very common thing to do is to make your size declarator a variable and then use it. Notice that we made it a constant. This language, unlike a great many others, requires that variable to be a constant if you're going to do it that way. If I went down here, all the way above my pause, my, and I did this, int size equals 4, 3, whatever. I'm probably going to wind up commenting these out. You don't have to type them. Int my nums subscript size like that. It underlines it because size is not a constant. The compiler demands to know and to be assured that the value of that is supposed to allocate for that cannot change. So we would have to declare that as a constant to get it to work. Now, I can't even think of what to do with this binoms business that we haven't already done. We could copy the elements of the old array into the new one. And by the way, that size of array divided by size of element doesn't work if you're passing the array to a function, which is perfectly illegal. You're supposed to be able to pass an array into a function. We'll give an example of that in a little bit. If you did type this, add the comment, must be a constant, or else this line won't compile. If you didn't type it because I didn't tell you to, or because I told you not to, then that's fine. Accessing array elements. You access them by their subscript, also known as their index. That's element 0, that's element 1, element 2, element 3, that's subscript 4. The way you state it like a computer scientist is you say is that the index, the subscript, can be from the values of 0 to n minus 1, where n is the length of the array. Do we have a syntax error we need to yeah. fix? All right. So any, any element in the array can be accessed just like it was a regular variable. What do I mean by that? Remember... We, we had that nums array up here, or some of y'all were calling it num. We well, could do this, right? Int x equals 3, int y is equal to 4, int z is equal to x plus y, right? We're allowed to do that. That's perfectly good. You could also do this. Nums subscript 3 is equal to nums subscript 1 plus nums subscript 2. That's totally legal. Right? Because that element is an int, and we could use it in any part of an equation, any part of a formula, that you can use an int. Now, we couldn't leave the subscript off. That's an error, right? It doesn't know what that means. So we have changed the third element. And if we printed out the array again, we would see that the third element has changed. Arrays must be accessed via the individual elements. In Python, this kind of worked. You could print parentheses list name. This doesn't work. That's why we had those four loops to print it out. Let's create an array with some numbers and then write a loop that will add up those numbers to create a total. Good old sales. We're going to calculate some sales. Double sales. How many sales are we going to have? Well, let's declare a constant to hold that. There's seven days in a week, so let's do const int days equals seven. 
And then our the length of our sales array, the size declared her, is going to be days. Let's put some sales in there. Days subscript 0 is equal to 100. Days subscript 1. Excuse me. What should that be? Sales. Yeah, that should be sales subscript 0 is equal to 100. Sales subscript 1 is equal to 200. And I'm just going to do some copying and pasting because I want to fill all seven spots, 0 through 6, with data. So I'm just, don't type my numbers, just type in whatever you feel. So I've got some data in it. I can write a loop that'll iterate through it. We could print them all out. While we're thinking about it, let's create an array of names of days, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday. This will be called a parallel array because it's the same length as the sales array, and the elements are united. They're linked together thematically by their index number. So weekdays, wait, got to declare the type, sorry, string weekdays, open subscript, close subscript equals, open curly brace, let's type in some day names, quote, M-O-N, end quote, comma, for Monday, quote, T-U-E, end quote, for Tuesday. You can see where this is going. Quote, W-E-D, end quote, comma. Quote, T-H-U, end quote, for Thursday. Only got two more to go, Friday and Saturday. No, I have Sunday as well. Quote, Fry, end quote, comma. Quote, Sat, end quote, comma. Quote, S-U-N. Close curly brace semicolon. and a for loop to print them out. Although we don't know how many weekdays there are, we could have gone ahead and put in days here. That is correct syntax. I just tacked that on there and it kind of guarantees that this array is seven elements long. So even if we had left off a day or two, it would be seven elements long. Now that kind of leaves open the question of what happens if this link doesn't match that link. Right, what if we had only five day names but we had set days equal to seven? Or what happens if we have more items in here than that supports? Well, I wonder if it would count that as a syntax error. This is just me playing. There. Now we have two more items than the days array could support. And when it's complaining about it, good, it's supposed to. But it is legal to have fewer elements in your initializer list than in your size declarator. All right, I'm going to compile it. Even though it's not printing anything new, I just want to make sure that it builds. No syntax errors, I hope. All right, and it worked. So let's print out this data. Let's print out our sales array. But we're going to use our weekdays array to give ourselves some labels so that we know Monday we sold $1,000 and Tuesday we sold 2001 and so on. So for same business, parentheses, I and T, I equals zero, I less than, what variable should I put here if I'm not going to use the size of trick? Well, how many days do we have? 
I could put 7, but we have a variable set to 7 up here, so I'm going to just put that there. So i less than days, i plus plus, Why not just put seven? Well, we may change this application so it's 31 days a month or something like that. We might move to the planet Klingon where every week has 10 days. I just made that up. All right, so let's print out, just for our debugging purposes, let's print out the index number. We might take that out because it's going to look ugly. No user wants to see day zero and day one and day two. They won't understand why there's a day zero. So C out arrow arrow I. Arrow, arrow, quote, space, quote. Put it backwards. Oh, backwards, thank you. Less than, less than, quote, space, quote. Could you scroll up from the beginning to the right? How far up? Uh, there. Um, that's good. All right. All right. So, and then arrow, arrow, followed by the day name which is weekdays subscript i followed by another space you know what, and we could be putting tabs here rather than just spaces so I'm going to replace that space with a slash t and that space with a slash t and then since I'm running out of room and you're not, I'm going to go to the next line and do arrow, arrow, sales, subscript I, in subscript. Maybe we'd want to put a dollar sign in front of it. I didn't. Arrow, arrow, NDL. And here we go, right? Monday we sold $1,000. Tuesday we sold $2,000. Wednesday we sold... I really would like to see that dollar sign there. And it'd be kind of nice to, uh, you know, print out what we were seeing, you know, have some kind of headers. We'll worry about that later. But I do want to see a dollar sign here. So before the sales, I'm going to print out a dollar sign, end quote, followed by that. So I just inserted that there. And we could use some I.O. manipulators to force ourselves to print, you know, a decimal point followed by two digits, which would be, you know, the number of cents, some, something like that. Okay, I'm liking that. Are we digging these numbers? Not really. I'm not. We could, del we could take that part out of our loop if we wanted to. The reason I put them there is to just reiterate the name, the fact that this is our weekday and that this is our sales and that's our index number. Let's print that out. Let's go ahead and add ourselves some headers. Above our for loop, do this. C out arrow arrow quote weekday end quote or backslash T for a tab Instead of the end quote, wait, wait, wait. Our first number isn't the weekday, it's the index. So I'm deleting all that. C out less than, less than, index, backslash T, weekday, backslash T, sales, backslash T. No, wait, we don't need a backslash T there. We need an, a backslash in. Go to the next line. I hope that looks good. Never can tell with tabs. There we go. I'll bring the code back in just a second. What do I want? What am I wanting you to see? Parallel arrays. We had a, an array called weekdays and an array called sales. Monday sales were a thousand. How do we know that? They both share the index zero. Tuesday sales were 2001. How do we know that? They both shared the index value one. And so on all the way up to Sunday, which is index six. So weekday six is Sunday. Sales six is 1200. So let's add a comment to our code as to what a parallel array is. Parallel arrays equals two or more arrays 
of the same length where the elements are linked by their subscripts. About time for us to stop. Yeah, we only have one minute left. Yep, we have one minute left. All righty. I'll bring the code back. I'm going to be staying after. And not all y'all are. I need to set a timer so we stop five minutes before. So I can tell you about your homework assignment. But I will anyways. No. You went, I want homework. It's too late. It's too late. We do that in less than a minute. Yeah, All right, here's our homework. Create an array of six ints called nums. Write code that places the first six digits of pi into the nums array. Don't use an initializer list. Yeah, what are the first six digits of pi? Well, what do you know? I give them to you right there. And then write a loop that'll print the nums array with a loop. And then down here, create an array called movies. Do use an initialization li list. Use the equal and the curly braces to set it to like four or five movies that you like. Or if you hate movies, books, or you know, great artists, Van Gogh versus you know Monet or whatever you like. And then print the movies with a for each loop. So if you follow the examples and the notes, this may be a really short homework assignment. And if you get stuck on it, if it's not a really short homework assignment, then go ahead and text me about it or let's stay after. No, we won't be able to stay after on Tuesday. Thursday is the only day I can stay after. All right, Dropbox. Why did I close the window? Pardon me? Do you not have a Dropbox for Teams lecture? Going to be. Wait, did we not? Did we not any upload, upload anything for Teams? Thought we did. It's right there. Oh, there's two Teams. No, there's no two T's. I hope not. Um, Anyways, let me make the use so that people can bail. All right.